All right, um, let's get, get started, I think. Maybe. Possibly. This seemed like a good idea like six months ago when I said I was, was going to do it. Um, so this is professional iOS, iOS app architecture, so I hope you're in the right spot. If not, there's, there's other talks elsewhere. Um, so my name is Justin Williams. Um, I am a software developer from here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, originally from Indiana, but I moved out here a couple years ago. Um, I don't use social media anymore, so I don't have that obligatory slide for, for self-promotion, sorry. Um, so just up front, front um, there are no demos in this talk. There's a lot of cut of code, but uh, in the interest of time and uh, my, sh my shaky hand when I try to do a demo, I didn't want to tempt the demo gods. Um, um, in place of that, though, I promise that I will give you a full sample project with all the slides, slides in a link at the end of this thing, which has more than enough, I would hope, I would hope, to alleviate uh, anyone who misses me fumbling, fumbling through Xcode live. Um, so, why am I doing this talk? Um, this is a weird kind of talk to do if you think if you think about it. Um, I've been doing 360 for a while, and in the last couple of years, I've been doing talks about auto layout. Um, 2013 was the first talk, achieving Zen with auto layout. Uh, uh, stupid auto layout tricks, that's my favorite title. One, and then last year, Master of Mastering Auto Layout. I even turned these into a book uh, that I sold for, my, for myself on Gumroad. Um, but this year, there's not been that much interesting new things happening, happening in auto layout. And I don't like to just rehash the same content year after year after year unless I have something valuable to add. Instead, I don't do that many talks anymore, so I like to, I like to just come up here and talk about what I've actually been doing in the last year. Like give you some real, real world um, kind of practical like use cases of the things I'm doing versus versus like some sort of like thesis statement or whatever. So I mean this year this year a lot of what I've been doing is working on architecture of an app. Um, my main source of work these days is uh, for TED, TED, not the bear, the talks. Um, and I am the lead developer on on the TED iOS app. Uh, TED's been on the app store since October of 2010. It first it first came with the original iPad and the iPhone 3GS. Um, um, it was originally designed to run on iOS 3.2. So it's been a, been a while. We're about to ship iOS 10. Um, for the last six years, we've been, been building on this same foundation without actually doing a rewrite, trying to adjust as everything has been changing with Apple as they change. change. So the first version of the app was 100% Objective-C. It used manual, mem manual memory management because there was no ARC. Uh, it was English only. And, it, and it, we had a separate, com completely separate interface for both the iPhone and the, I and the iPad, as well as the launch sequence. So when you launched the app, we would detect what device you were, you were and then give you a completely separate app, even though it was a universal binary. And, and like I said, it was designed for the original iPhone 3GS and the iPad 1.1.0. So in that time, this is kind of what has, what has changed and what we've had to account for. Um, we've gone from the iPhone 4 to 4 to the iPhone 5 to the iPhone 6S Plus. There's an iPad 12 9, 9 um, a thing called Swift, size classes, auto layout. There's been a, there's been a lot, of, lot of changes that we've had to account for. And again, we haven't really, haven't really tackled doing a whole rewrite of the app, as tempting as it may be. In June, we shipped uh, TED 3.0, which is uh, um, the biggest release I've done since 2.0 in 2012. And right now, right now we're at about 50% uh, Swift 2.2, 50% Objective-C. Every, everything is running on ARC. Everything has been converted to use auto layout and size classes, classes uh, which allowed us then to more easily localize and deploy the app or the app in 22 languages, which was the big feature of the 3.0 release. And we support devices going all the way down to the iPhone 4S, all the way, all the way up to the iPad 12.9, which is a gargantuan, gargantuan device. So. We talked about the device changes, but we haven't, but we haven't actually talked about uh, how best practices have changed. Um, if you look at the look at the TED 1.0 source code, um, the best way I could describe it is unapologetically, genetically, massively view controllered. Um, everything was in these view, con view controllers. There was business logic, view code, analytics. Uh, um, our data layer was this interesting computer science project of core data that I, that I can't really explain that well. Um, and just, and just everything was just sprinkled everywhere. There wasn't really that great of an architecture, and this is not, is not by fault of me or the developers before. That's just, we've been learning, learning as we go with iOS how to like evolve these best practices, and Swift has changed, changed a lot of that for us as well. So separation of concerns, what, what I don't know. That's like, behind there's a messy uh, bedroom. That's kind of what we were, we were going for. So why this talk? I'm gonna show you how my sausage is just made. 
Um, I always find those kind of blog posts interesting when someone explain, explains how they built something from the ground up. I kind of want to give you an insight into how, how uh, we've architected TED 3.0, and hopefully then you can go, go and take something from that. So this is a pretty good overview of how the app is right, is right now. There's some stuff that's not in it yet, but will be. But this is also a lot of, lot of this is how I would build a new app if I started today. So um, warning, opinionated developer incoming. Please don't take anything I think I say up here as gospel. I'm not trying to sound authoritarian or anything. Um, this, um, this is the way I do it. It's not the best way. It's just my way. Uh, uh, my goal is I hope that you pick up a couple things from this and you can take that, take that and add it to your uh, blueprint for how you build apps as well. So here's what we're, here's what we're gonna cover. Um, just four topics kind of broken down. Um, um, first, I'm gonna talk about how we use frame for, uh, framework first development. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about dependency management because everyone loves talking about dependency management. <laughs> uh, data parsing and persistence and network access. So first up, let's talk about uh, framework, frameworks design. So the first version of the TED app, the app was one target. It was the TED iOS app target, and everything, everything was kind of broken into that. Um, one of the first big projects I undertook once iOS came out was to break the app down into separate frameworks. And that's because Apple added support for dynamic frameworks on iOS. Um, before that, you could just use uh, static libraries, which would just be compiled into your, into your code. With dynamic frameworks, we have the dynamic linking at runtime, but also the, also the ability to encapsulate things actually in the application, uh, uh, such as view controllers, asset catalogs, uh, the headers, and everything in there. It made it a, made it a lot nicer experience. Um, it's also necessary, necessary if you want to use Swift, because uh, ABI stability is a thing that is never going to, going to show up, apparently. So if you, you can't use static libraries with Swift anyway, anyway. So one of the nice things about using the dynamic frameworks, though, is, is it allows us to have a better separation of concerns. Um, we can, can instead build a framework that's designed entirely around uh, data persistence, or we can build, we can build a framework that's entirely designed around supporting our ad display displays and things like that. So we can keep it a little bit away from that main target or share it, and it into another thing. This also enables better testability. Um, if I just need to test something on my core data related code, code I can just run the test on TED data. Um, I can also design it so that it's more, test, more testable in that isolated framework scenario as well. Um, frameworks, frameworks also allow for the incremental compilation. Like I said, I can just build one of my uh, framework targets if I need to, or if I bundle it in the app, it can make things, things uh, run a little bit faster because I'm not compiling that code each time I'm going through. through. So this is a little bit how we've kind of broken the TED app, TED app down. And we break it down kind of into three frameworks and then the main pro project. So in the application project, it's our view controllers, uh, things like uh, app-specific helper classes that we need, uh, uh, view models and whatnot, as well as like app extensions, like the widgets and things like that. that. Um, we have core, which contains kind of the stuff that's shared between everything, whether, thing, whether it be logging, um, settings, uh, like NS user defaults, things, things like that, as well as like our Swift or Objective-C extensions and categories that we want to share. Uh, we keep a network framework that has anything related to, to API requests, which we use in structs. Uh, this is all operation-based, based. we'll cover this later on as well as data as another framework which you use for persist persistence, JSON parsing, and other business logic in the models. Um, not pictured on here, done here, but relevant to TED is we also have a separate video player framework that has all of, all of our uh, HLS handling, AB Foundation, Chromecast, all that fun stuff and stuff. Um, so if you do build for, for frameworks-based design, one of the things I do recommend, and this is, this is maybe controversial, maybe not, I like to build for all the platforms. So, so we have, we're only on the iPhone and iPad right now. We don't have a TV, a TV OS target. That's a TV ML app. We don't do the watch OS. We have a couple, a couple sub projects on the Mac for like utilities, but all of our uh, uh, sub frameworks we build for all four platforms. And the reason I do this is, is um, on the off chance that we might take over the TV OS app, app one, um, but also for, it, I think it leads to writing better code, code because you add that extra constraint in there that you can think, all right, I can, I can use this uh, this way on watchOS, but I can't use this way on macOS. Um, once you start thinking about that way, I think it leads to writing better code, and the, and the cognitive load of that isn't so heavy after you kind of get used to it. Like the first, first couple days I did it was not pleasant, but once you start working with it, and the Swift, ava Swift availability stuff makes it even easier, um, it's kind of the default way I do it right now, right now, and it's working pretty well for me. 
Um, we also take a really good advantage of schemes for this. So, like, if we have a, we have a framework called Grande, which was a medium wrapper I wrote. Get it? Medium Grande, Grande. Ha ha ha. Um, so we have, I have an all-platforms one, and that builds all four targets, but then I have a scheme for Mac OS, iOS, tvOS, and watch, and watch OS. So if I want to just test and build for that single one, I can go ahead, it's, ahead, it's going to build faster, it's going to show me, like, all right, this is why this is crapping out, thing out for Mac OS, uh, let's go ahead and fix that. Um, to speed things up, one of the things I like to do with our frameworks, too, is pre-compile them, compile them. So if you work with Swift, you realize how slow the compiler is. Like, you could have, I have, a pretty impressive iMac that I, bought, that I bought last year, and it's slow compiling Swift. I use an Objective-C C project that I inherited from another client a few weeks ago, and I compiled it, compiled it from scratch. I was like, oh wow, I forgot what fast compilation was. Um, so when you're working with something like Swift, one of the things I like to do is deal with pre-compiling -comp pre frameworks that I know aren't going to change. So if our data model isn't changing, or the Jing, or the core libraries aren't changing, just building them as a pre-compiled thing and putting them in our application, application target makes it a little bit easier for us to build and work on the fly. Which kind of transitions to my next thing, which is dependency management. So if you want to do dependency management, you've got kind of three options right now, I would say. Um, you've got Cocoa Pods, you've got Carthage, and you've got Living in the Stone Age. Um, if you're a Mac developer, I guess you can use Swift Package Manager right now. Um, I, haven't, I haven't messed with it that much. Um, personally, I use Carthage. Um, um, I'm sure Cocoa Pods is a lovely thing. I just don't use it. So, oh, um, great. So, why do I like Carthage? Um, one, it's decentralized. So, there's very little overhead for me to actually, to actually use this thing. I install it through Homebrew, Brew install Carthage. It downloads, downloads, it runs, and then it's entirely based off of Git repo, repos and Xcode projects. There's no things like a Podspec file. Um, um, there's no like weird Swift PM file. It's just it goes into my Xcode project in my in my Git repo, builds my shared schemes, and generates a dynamic framework out of, out of that. So it's very low in terms of taking over my code. I would say like I understand exactly what it's doing because it's doing the same thing I think I would do if I was building it from scratch. It just makes it a little bit easier for me to pull that all that stuff in and add it to my app itself. So getting back to back to my building of uh, frameworks on the fly. Um, one, of the, one of the nice things about Carthage is if you are really good about tagging your uh, uh, releases in Git, um, you can append that to your cart file itself. And you can say, like, sorry, this is a little bit blurry, I think. It might not be. But you, but you can say, all right, I want to pin this release only to version 0, 0 0.5, and it will take the uploaded zip file binary of that, of that framework downloaded. I don't have to recompile it because it's already been built and compiled. And that, and that helps uh, save a little bit of time when you're actually building stuff. Um, if you're working, if you're working with Xcode 8 and Swift 3 right now, that's not really easy to do. That's that's. I spend a lot of time waiting for Swift 3 to recompile things. Things. Um, so if you use Carthage to do this, it's pretty easy to do with the Carthage Carthage command. So you go into your framework and you run Carthage build dash 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 no skip current Carthage archive uh, whatever your framework name is. Um, you don't need to write this down. The slides are in the GitHub repo at the end with all this stuff in it. In it. So. I was checking my 360 IDEV contract, and it said if I was going to talk about dependency management, I was contractually actually required to uh, give you the dependency lecture by Krusty the Greybeard. Beard. Um, so there, you can use as, many, use as many dependencies as you want. You just don't want to use too many, I guess. You don't want to go full Node.js. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 tr I tend to think, like, Ted has, I think the last I checked, we have, like, we have seven dependencies right now. And we're a two to three person team. So depending on how many people are coming in and out of the project. So I feel like there's a, there's a very fun, it's kind of like politics. You're either over here, you're over here, you're over here. I like to be somewhere in the middle. Like I don't have everything dependency extracted out to like some third party open source code, but I also don't believe in doing not, doing not invented here. So your mileage may vary. Um, I don't think dependency manage, managers are the reason that people use more dependencies than not. It's just kind of what you like to do. So oh, these are some of the things that we use in TED and like. Um, we use Freddy from uh, Big, uh, Big Nerd Ranch. It's a JSON parsing library that makes it really easy to uh, uh, work with uh, complex data types. Um, um, sometimes I use just straight NSJSON part serialization. It kind of depends on one time, time uh, constraints. And uh, if I want to actually like build this thing, this thing from scratch, more often than not, Freddy is pretty stable and pretty nice. 
Uh, we use pen, we use pen remote image for uh, image downloading and caching. Uh, I threw out some code, some code that Ted had written six years ago to handle that and just opted to use, to use pen remote image because I didn't want to fix bugs in code when this is a solved problem. Uh, we also use uh, Valet from Square for handling stuff like keychains. And I think that's what, it, that's what it really gets down to is we have, a, we have a small team. I don't like to reinvent the wheel for things that are solved problems. And something like pen remote image or Valet for keychain handling, those are solved, solved problems. They're really well written code from companies that I trust uh, with developers that I'm happy, I'm happy to contribute back to. So that works well for me. So next let's talk about uh, parsing and persistence. It's, I promise we're getting to code. We'll get there eventually. eventually. So when it comes to uh, persistence, I really hate core data. <laughs> I really do. Like, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I love it. It is by far the biggest source of crashes that we have, have in our app, according to Hockey. Um, and it's internal framework one, ones, um, it's dealing with weird multi-threading things. Uh, core data is one of those things that I would just wish Apple would, Apple would throw away and start over. Like it's just very hard and difficult to understand. Like you need, you need a PhD to actually understand how to set up a core data stack. In, in NS persistent, persistent container may fix some of that. That's still, there's so much overhead I'm not a fan, a fan. But despite my disdain for core data, we still use it at TED for a variety of legacy, legacy reasons. Um, and also kind of safety reasons. If I, get, if I get fired, I don't want the next guy to have to like inherit my third party persistence license layer if I don't, if they don't want to. So things like that, like that. So I also have this belief that every year I go into uh, WWDC on EC and I'm like, this is the year they're gonna fix core data. This is the year, I know it, I know it. And, and I keep getting disappointed and sad. Me personally, personally I like Realm. Um, I use Realm usually, not at TED, although, although we're using it for a couple of small things as kind of a test bed, uh, which I'll talk about, talk about when we get to the network stack stuff. Um, but for any new projects that I'm dealing with, dealing with uh, either for my own interest development or just experimentation, or even I got it in a shipping client project now, uh, we're using Realm and we're, and we're using it successfully. So for those that don't know, don't know Realm is a... Uh, it's a third-party persistence, persistence framework uh, based up by a company out in California. Uh, uh, it's pretty easy to adopt. It's got, adopt. It's got native bindings for both Objective-C and, and Swift, um, which makes it really easy to work with. The documentation is great. And I found it to be pretty stable. Um, it works really well in both persisting stuff, stuff on disk into your realm files, as well as setting up in-memory store, stores, which you can then use in test. Like, just working with it is a lot more, ple more pleasant than having to set up a persistent model or a managed object model and a persi persistent container and a coordinator and all these sorts of things. So, so it's not all sunshines and daisies, though. Um, since, since we're using the uh, Swift version of the Realm bindings, uh, um, we're having a lot of pain with ABI stability because every week there's a new version, new version of Swift 3, which means we have to recompile and fix whatever, whatever they decided to change this week and then hopefully get that, to, get that to go through. And when I talk about Swift being slow to compile, Realm is my biggest uh, pain, pain one. I can go make a sandwich and I'll come back and this thing's still compiling. There's a lot, a lot involved in it. Um, and it's also, it's a startup. They're funded, they, they say they make money by selling support, but they could disappear tomorrow. So gauge your level of paranoia about those sorts of things. But, but most of their code is pretty much, it's all open source, you can see what's happening in the flaw. Um, so, Let's write some code. And by, and by write, I mean I'm going to show you code. I'm not writing code on stage. Um, finally. So for an example project, I wanted to give you guys a little sample. sample. And what I've done is I've built a little medium. And all it does is it takes a token that you get from your medium account, account and then you authenticate against it, and then it shows you a list of the publications that you, that you follow. So whichever thought leaders you're most interested in, it will show you a listing, a listing of those, and you tap on it, and it will open it to a Safari view controller. Very basic, but I, think, but I hope it will show a little bit of how we're using Realm for um, um, persistence. So for this sample project, we've got just a, just a couple models that we deal with. We're dealing with a user model, so when we pass our token in and hit, and hit authenticate, well, all that's really doing is pushing back uh, your user profile, the tile that's attached to that token. And we're going to persist that into a, into a user object. And this is, um, sorry that's a little bit, a little bit off screen, but it's, that just says public. So it's not, I don't think you're missing that much. Um, so yeah, so this is basically our uh, 
user ob user object as written in Realm. There's no uh, data model file like there is in Core Data. Core data. Um, any sort of relationships and things like that, it's all written in code. Code, And so you have, uh, it descends from object, which is our object type, type uh, which we get from Realm itself. Um, we have each of these different, these different properties. It supports all the native properties in iOS, such as string, strings and ints and things like that. Um, we've got a couple, couple read-only properties to turn our URL strings that we get from a the API into actual, actual URL objects. Um, this is all written in Swift 3 and Xcoded, by the way, uh, because why not? And, and then we, and we, at the bottom, we override this static function called primary key to let Realm know which one is our, one is our primary key. And then it can use that to do find or create methods and things and things like that. So going back to my previous, previous slide, if we go to that, after we authenticate, we've got this publication list where we're showing things, which ones you subscribe to. And the model for that would be our publication right here. And so again, this is the same thing as we're showing before and before pretty much. We've got the ID, the title, the string, all these sorts of these sorts of things. It's pretty basic how much work we have to do to set up each of, each of these. It's also a lot more readable and searchable than I feel like a core data model is, is um, just because I can search the code, see my documentation, it's all right there, there without having to actually uh, generate that on the fly from something like Mojo Generator, generator or whatever, which I love Mojo Generator, I contribute to it. It's just, I like Realm better, Realm better. So to actually work with a realm, this is some code that I pulled from a sample, sample from the sample app for uh, doing that. And all we're doing really is instantiating and instantiating an instance of a realm, and then we're doing it in a uh, try block. Uh, uh, we're just writing the objects that we uh, have created earlier up in the code that you can't see, can't see, and then it's persisting it to the realm itself. Um, there's there's no weird con concurrency rules attached to this. You basically basically you can only use the realm that you instantiate on that thread. Sorry. The realm can only be on one thread, so you can't, so you can't like pass realms between different threads, and that's basically the only rule you have to keep up with. There's, there's no weird concurrency types and all the other crazy weirdness that uh, uh, Core Data has. Somebody's going to tell the Core Data guy that I'm trashing it, and I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> um, so let's talk, let's talk about JSON. So now that we've show, I've showed you how to parse or just persist a basic realm object, object this is the JSON that we get back from um, Medium whenever I, want, whenever I want to get my profile except my ID is not ASDF, ASDF, ASDF. And so how do we take that and get that into our Realm object? Well, for this, for this I'm using Freddy, which we talked about earlier, which is the JSON parsing library that I'm a fan of. And the way that works is it has this uh, JSON decodable codable, and JSON encodable uh, pr protocols that you can conform to. And the decodable codable one lets you take in a JSON object and parse that out into each uh, different object you have. And so I've created a convenience initializer here, here that just goes through and says, all right, take the string value, value from data ID and put that in ID, name, take from data name, blah, 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 and go through that. So what that does is it creates the Realm object, parses the JSON that we've passed in. JSON is a type that it gets from Freddy, which, which we'll, you'll see when we go through the operations, and then persists that, and then, and then we can then go and write that data to the actual um, database itself. So, so this is some of the code that we have from our parsing operation that is part of the network layer where what I'm doing is sometimes we have, we have a data, everything that comes from the Medium API is wrapped in data as kind of, as kind of its like top level object. Sometimes it's an array, sometimes it's a dictionary. So, so we try to check out if uh, we have it as an array. And if we do, we're able, we're able to uh, go ahead and say parse our objects from data and, data and then map it to type T and use the JSON decodable initial initializer to do that. And so T is our generic, and then in that case, we could pass in, pass in user, which is our user object, or publication, which is our publication object, and go from, go from that. If it's just a dictionary, then we'll just try and parse it from type T, T, passing in the JSON, and then return that as a single array result. And then if we have failure, then we go through and we fail. We, we failed very poorly. So that's, that's parsing and persistence. Um, the last kind of chunk that I want to, I want to talk about is uh, how we handle network requests and requests and operations. And this is this is something I've something I've added into my kind of repertoire in the last year or so. And, and I around the, earlier this year I wrote a blog blog post kind of saying like this is my toolkit of what I built that was pretty popular. And one of the things I said I said in this post was I don't use AF networking. I don't use Alamo Fire. I don't, I don't use whatever third-party networking library is out there most of the time. And I don't use them because most of the time, most of the time I don't need to. 
Um, we don't do, like the only time I'd really consider using, consider using something like Alamo Fire is if I had to have SSL pen in because doing that on your own is, on your own is painful. Um, but we don't. And so I tend to just use raw, raw NSURL session from the ground up and I just wrap it in my own little way to, hey, to handle it. So when it comes to network access, there's a couple, a couple different ways that I handle this. Um, one is I use a result uh, protocol to basically uh, de define if I have success or failure. Um, I have different protocols that define our uh, each request request. So each request to the API, whether it be getting the user profile or getting, or getting a list of publications, each one of those is de defined in a struct that ha has uh, and conforms to a specific protocol about re request. And then everything is powered by operation queues. There's operation subclasses for different things, and they're all funneling into different queues. queues. So when I say it's result-based, um, this is kind of, kind of my bread and butter of my networking library, which you've probably seen this before. I, I certainly did not have known this myself. Um, but basically, I have an enum called result. Result, it takes a type T. And then on success, I pass in whatever T T is. And on failure, I pass the error in. And then when I, I actually use this in code, hey, I took a screenshot where it said, go forward. Good job, Justin. Um, um, go me. Uh, so it says token text field, we got our token value, we're, new. we're creating a URL session configuration, allowing cellular access. Where it says go forward, it's basically I'm saying what the network service type is, it's just default. I think that's a new feature, and I think it's just new in 10, where you can say if you're like using, like using video, or default, or like VoIP, and then it, iOS is supposed to handle your energy consumption a little bit better based on that. Uh, we pass that, in, pass that into a URL session, which we then pass into our network API, which is an object, an object that we create. With our access token, the URL session we want to use because we're trying to use we're trying to use one session for everything, and then we call network get profile, which returns a result. And then if the result is a success, then we call we call this show publications method or we show objects, whatever we want to do. I've, I've got the underscore and success right now. Sometimes we can pass in like the JSON if that's what we get what we get back. The objects itself, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to put in there, you can put in there. And then on failure, uh, we can just pass the error and then we print that out there. Um, you'll notice also that get profile is uh, there's an underscore equals. Um, whenever I do this, I return the operation uh, that we're actually working with. And the reason I do that is it makes it really easy for you then to then to observe the values like is finished, is executing, uh, is canceled, and you can use you can use that to show uh, things to the user. Like if you're doing the pull to refresh, you can keep that, re that refreshing. You can put something up on the screen. It's a real nice way to observe like what's at, what's actually happening with uh, the interface for the user. Um, so when I say this stuff is protocol oriented, this is this is kind of what I mean. Um, each request is built off of a protocol called API API request, uh, and then descending from that is a new one called, called uh, generated request, which takes all the content from the API request, request protocol that we've created, and then generates an actual URL URL request or NS URL request in uh, iOS nine nine Swift two two land, and then we pass that request into our network op work operation, which goes ahead and throws that into the URL session, creates the data task, and gives us our stuff back. So this is the actual actual API request itself. Um, there's not that many things that are that great in there. Right in there. It's just, there's your base URL, whether it's what method it is, post, get, get, put, whatever. Uh, the path, uh, any parameters that you want to add, add, like URL parameters, any additional headers. If you're posting something, you might think you might want to pass an HTTP body. Uh, I have that as a different struct in there. You'll see, you'll see that in the sample code. I'm not putting it in slides for time, and then we pass, we pass our uh, medium access token, so we go from there. Um, um, sorry, this is cut off again. But at the top it says, it says protocol generated request conforms to API request. There's one function on generated request, and it's this construct request, which we create an extension on, and this just goes through, reads those values from our API, API request, and generates the uh, URL request for us that we can then pass in to our operation. So in the case of our, our we sh I showed you before how to get the publication itself. Um, this, um, this is the struct to actually do that. It's pretty basic. Um, we're conforming thing to generate a request. Uh, we're past, we have a custom initializer that, pass, that passes in the user ID for who you want to get the publication for, uh, uh, the access token to authenticate with Medium, and then we set, we set the path value to be slash user, slash user ID, slash publication locations. And that's really all. I have one of these uh, structs for every API call that I have in the app. So 
for our sample app, that's two. For or, uh, TED's app, we've had maybe a dozen. It's not that big of an API. And, and it makes it really easy to kind of just go in, see which uh, requests we're working with, what the values and parameters are, and how it's easily built. So when we actually use this in practice, um, this is from our, from our network API class. We have a function called get publications. We generate the template request. We add this to our uh, medium API API operation, uh, NS operation subclass, and we pass in the test and the template, the URL session, and then the completion handler. And then we add it to our actual, actual uh, queue. And uh, we, when I'm doing this networking stuff I, stuff, I have two different queues. I have a foreground queue and a background queue, which I, hopefully I'll get to talk about, talk about at the end. Um, so what, what is medium API operation? So basically all that is is a subclass of uh, uh, NS operation. I'm going to keep calling it NS operation instead of operation. My, my mind is not taking the great renaming well yet. Um, and basically, there's three operations inside of it. There's the network access operation, which goes, goes and fetches the JSON values for us. There's a separate operation for JSON parsing. parsing. So we take what we got from the previous operation, we parse it into, into actual objects, and then there's a persistence operation that we then write them to, them to the realm. And each of these is managed inside this medium API operation by an, in, an internal queue that has all this different data that we can handle and handle inside of that. So once one finishes, the next one is added as a dependent one, a, a dependent operation, and then the next one happens after that. And they all kind of run run in parallel. And then the ultimate goal is get the API guy, get the data, parse it, and then persist it. And then I can use my my UI to go and listen for those changes to the database and then write from it. So a little bit more on how I'm using operations. Um, like I mentioned, I have one queue for user interactive requests. So if the user is, the user is actually like requested, like in the case of TED, if they've requested, I want to see like, like what your most recent talks are, and they hit refresh for that, we'll put that on the uh, high, uh, higher priority queue. We also have a background queue for things they don't necessarily, don't necessarily ask for. Like we sync the uh, talk database under the hood for, for them so that they can use the app if they're on the train or something and they don't have network access. Um, that's not super high priority in terms of uh, requirements. So we run that on a slower queue. Um, and we're doing, we're doing all this based on NS quality of service. So when you look at the sample code, if you look at add to, add to queue, it basically says, if the quality of service is low or very low, put it on the lower priority queue. Otherwise, put it on the higher one. And within me, me as the developer, I can kind of decide which one is the higher priority. And I usually base it off if it's a user interactive thing versus uh, something that I just need to, need to do to like, clean up things on the back end. So even more on operations. Um, so one of the one of the other nice things about operations is I am also able to adjust the concurrency concurrency of these different queues based on network availability. And this is what I was talking about, talking about how we're using Realm in testing with uh, the TED app right now. Right now is whenever you make a network request going through uh, TED Network, which is our which is our version of this uh, in the app. Um, when the operation starts, it starts. I track the time. I then track how much is downloaded, and then when it finished, and then I'm able to able to calculate the bandwidth. And then we take the, uh, each time we do that, we do that, we put it into an in-memory realm that we can then kind of go through and de determine like how good your network connection is. So if the last few connections have been relatively, relatively slow, your network might be kind of crappy. All right, let's lower the priority and concurrency of all these operations so that we can guarantee like if you, if you hit refresh, we're gonna send you that JSON data back, but we might not send back the, Im the images for them just yet because they're on the lower priority queue that we've slowed down its, its max concurrent operations. And then if the internet starts getting faster again, then, then, then we can bump that back up to a more normal variety for them. And then, and then I mentioned this a little bit before, but then this also allows me to listen with KBO EO to is executing, is finished, and is canceled states so I can show things like, things like that to the user. Um, so I promised there would be code in slides. So this is your URL that has, uh, that has a full sample project with everything, everything I've talked about uh, in it. Uh, github.com slash justin slash idev2016. Or if you just forget that, just go to Justin. Justin, it's the first repo because I just pushed it last night. Um, so the slides are on there. Um, an example of all this operation stuff is on there, there. And I've tried to comment the code as much as I can where it hopefully makes sense. So um, that's all I have. Um, so thank you for coming. For coming. Um, if you have questions, come talk to me up here. Thanks.